So I'm making this video for it's really more for myself to ease my conscience and to get all this stuff out there. But I've been very vocal and very open about how I feel and what I've kind of what I've been going through. And everyone knows how I feel on Facebook from the stuff I post. So I'm making this video to give everyone the full context if they want it. If not, that's fine. Like I said, it's more for myself. But I'm going to start from the beginning, and I'm not going to leave pretty much anything out. I'm going to get really personal, so just know that. So there were three things that kind of... that Three main things that happened during my childhood, very formidable years, ages 7 to 13. So puberty, pretty much. There were three things specifically that happened to me. The first is, I thought about... started thinking about sex. And actually really thinking about it at a very young age. So I was seven years old and I, there's this girl I used to hang out with, I'm not going to say any names, but we used to hang out when we were little kids and when I was seven uh, we were at my house, we were acting out some sort of play and we kissed. And it wasn't just like a pack, it was like a three or four second actual makeout. And I definitely remember that and I was like seven at that time, but I hadn't really thought much about anything regarding sex up until that point. So then second grade comes around and I'm eight years old and I start hanging out with one of my friends who lived a couple houses down from me. And we used to go into his basement and his dad had Playboys that he always used to look at. And we used to look at them all the time. Always look at Playboys. We always used to talk about this girl at school that we both liked. Um, so I definitely I had these things on my mind at an extremely young age. That's one of the things that contributed to what I have experienced. The second is trauma, and repeated trauma, specifically about homosexuality. Now this started when I was looking at the Playboys in that, at that kid's house, he had brothers. And there was one instance where I remember I, I said something that maybe, maybe I had said I was gay, something along those lines. But I remember being made fun of and ridiculed for that a lot by him and his brothers. And at the time, you know, I wasn't really upset by specifically what they were making fun of me for. I was more upset just by the fact that they were making fun of me. But it really wasn't, I really wasn't too upset by it at the time. So then third grade goes by, everything's fine. And in my fourth grade, towards the end of fourth grade, I'm ten years old, and I know I'm gay at this point. Like... I definitively, I, I know for sure, like, I, I have the feelings, and I can consciously think I'm gay. I've thought about it all. And with that came very negative feelings about it. And I couldn't really explain the negative feelings at the time. I didn't know why I felt that way about it, but I felt like I needed to wait. I didn't really want to tell people about it yet. I felt like I needed to keep it in. So then fifth grade comes, and fifth grade was when the trauma got really bad. So I'm in, f I'm in fifth grade class, and I used to write, read and write a lot. And the kids in that class, not all of them, but a good amount of them, they used to make fun of me, ridicule me, tease me, for being gay, specifically. So obviously, knowing at this point that I am gay, that that's real, um, made me feel, feel very upset. Very upset. But at the same time, I was still, I didn't want to tell anyone. I would still had, the only thing I had about being gay from the outside was, it's very negative, keep it to yourself, it's a really bad thing. So also in fifth grade, I started playing Little League. And Little League, the tra I didn't get made fun of as much, but it's the same thing. There were certain, certain times throughout Little League where I got made fun of for being gay, even though I hadn't told anyone that I was gay. That's just what I got made fun of for being, you know maybe different things I did um, but that all happened and I played Little League up through 8th grade and the trauma didn't really continue all the way through it was really 5th and 6th grade where I played Little League where it happened there um, but then 6th and 7th grade that's beginning middle school I didn't really get made fun of as much for being gay in those days but I saw a lot of people get made fun of for being gay even though they weren't gay, that's just, if you said something that maybe, maybe indicated that you might be, even if you deny it after, ridicule constantly, always bring it up. 
And so that happened through sixth grade and in seventh grade, and then seventh grade something specific happened. And I've already I've already had trauma and all this stuff happen to me. But there's lot this is the last bit of trauma I guess I experienced when it, as as far as a, uh, as far as being made fun of for being gay goes. And it's something my dad my dad said. And please reserve judgment because my dad is one of the best people I know. And you know I. We've talked about this. I don't put any blame on him, and at this point, it was already I had already had dealt with so much that it was unlikely I was gonna be able to to speak this to somebody at this point in my life. But the reality is, we lived in a different culture back. This was eleven years ago, ten years ago, and it was different. Gays weren't viewed as 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 the same as everybody else. Not by everyone, but that's that's more what the culture viewed back then. And he, the, what he said wasn't even extremely negative. Like it wasn't like a terrible, terrible thing, but it was very negative against gays. And it, I, the way I read it was, I can't be gay because that's very bad for me if I am. So that's the trauma I experienced, and that was from ages seven to thirteen. And the last thing that ties all this together is religion. Now, not specifically the church I went to, because I was pretty religious when I was younger. The church I went to was pretty awesome. Uh, still some of the best people I've ever met. But the fact was, I was really religious. And when I was younger, when I was about eight, I was told, and I remember this specifically, I was told by someone that if you are gay, you will go to hell. And that stuck with me. And also, I look at religion as... A, as being a bigger influence because all these people who had negative views towards gays likely comes from religion. So when you take the repeated trauma, when you take learning about sex at a very young age, and then you have the religion, and this all happened within six years, some of the most, some of the greatest developments in childhood, puberty, and I get all these negative feelings about, about being gay, and then something happened. And it was pretty much right after my dad said what he did in seventh grade that was kind of the nail in the coffin for it. I said, I'm not telling anyone I'm gay, ever. That is what I told myself. I said, I can't tell anyone I'm gay because if I do, it will be impossible for me to gain respect from anybody. Because all I had seen is people, myself included, be ridiculed constantly for being gay. No one viewed them as a respectable individual, as like an actual, the same as everybody else. That's not how people were viewed back then, or gays were viewed back then. I mean, it may still be like that in, in schools, I'm not really sure. But that's at least how it was when I was uh, younger. And that's the message I got. So I knew I was gay, but deep down, or I, deep, yeah, deep down I knew I was gay, but if I wanted respect from anybody, being gay was not going to get me there. It was going to get me the opposite of that. At least that's the way I interpreted it. And at that young age of 13, I told myself, I told myself, even though I knew, I said, I'm not gay. I knew I was gay, but I told myself I'm not. So then 8th grade comes, and once I get to high school, between 9th and 11th grade, I'm in kind of my shell. And I'm really reserved. I don't really talk to anybody. I'm too scared to even express any part of myself for fear of being exposed and also for fear of just being shamed and ridiculed more. So those three years go by and then senior year, something happens. Uh, by chance, you know, I meet some girls at IHOP and I get involved with one of them. And that idea that I'm not gay just sort of sat in my mind for the last three, four years before then. And once, once I got my first taste of, you know, the way people looked at me once I, once they saw me with a woman, and just the, the different responses I got from it, I liked it a lot. So that idea that I'm not gay, that to gain respect that you can't be gay, what I did with that is I interpreted it as, okay, if I want to gain respect, I have to pursue women. And that idea just grew and grew and grew after after that first uh, specific incident. It was the fall of 2011. 
but it grew and with that came hockey so between hockey and women that was how I was going to gain my respect and get people to respect me and because that's I couldn't respect myself so that I needed that respect from others I desperately needed that and this is where when I talk about that idea grew this is where my egoic mind comes into play and when I say egoic mind I mean conscious mind because that idea that, that I'm not gay that stuck in my head for so long I still no matter throughout the entire thing I knew deep down I was but it grew to such a degree that it literally controlled everything I did so every decision I've I've made in the past four or five years has been based on the fact that I am not gay and I have to not only prove that to myself but I need to prove it to everyone else by earning their respect so this egoic mind I talk about or this conscious mind was basically in control from my senior year in complete control my senior year all the way through up until May June of this year until I cut it off but there was uh, during all that there was some things that happened uh, back in 2013 it was a year before I moved to Utah and I had an incident I was on the Blackbirds and I had just been named captain and I had an incident with a girl and I'm not gonna go into too much detail but pretty much I went to have sex with her and I couldn't get hard I could not it wouldn't work and you know that was sort of it was just it was just a very stunning eye-opening moment where I, I just I'd have to be honest with myself and say no this is who you are you're gay you're trying to bury this it's not going away and it, you need to get a handle on it. So that hit me during that moment. Now you'd think maybe rational thinking would prevail and I would figure out a solution to it. But that's not what happened. Instead, I pushed it farther. And I began to get very stressed from it. And right around beginning of 2014, right before I moved to Utah, I started to get addicted to pot. And that's still something I'm dealing with now. I needed to relieve myself of the stress I was feeling, and pot was my escape. And I like to tell people that I went to Utah to play hockey, like that was my reason for going there, but that really wasn't it. The main reason I went there was to escape, to get away from my problems. And I knew this problem was going to follow me, but for some reason my egoic mind thought that it'd be better away. And honestly, it was right for a little bit. The first few months I was in Utah, things were good. You know, it was kind of like adrenaline rush. I met a lot of new people. Um, I, I saw, saw things from di different points of view. Um, it was just a really fun time where I was kind of discovering myself a little bit. And I was able to express myself more than, than I was here. But eventually, you know, beginning of 2015, that sort of wore off, that adrenaline rush of meeting all these new people and stuff. And the same problems began to weigh on me. And during during those first few months in Utah, some things happened. I got a DUI. Um, my schooling didn't really go really well. Hockey ended up going terribly. And then on top of it all, in February 2015, my car got ruined by my one of my ex-roommates. Yeah, I let him use it, and he... Uh, didn't put in enough oil and the engine broke. So I had a lot of things going on at that time. So right around spring of 2015, right around the end of that semester, when everything has been gone, everything, my, all my my hockey school, everything's, everything's pretty much done. I get very depressed and social anxiety gets, starts to get really bad. And right around this time is when I start to get guilty. I start to feel horribly guilty because I know what I'm doing is, t is wrong. I know that what I'm pursuing is not right. I know I'm gay, and I know I had to address that before anything was gonna actually function the right way. But I couldn't do it. I just could not do it. So throughout the summer, I didn't know what I was gonna do. And my friend, one of my friends asked me to live with them in Muncie, and I said, okay. And I go there, I was there for like two weeks. 
and I had to move. And the reason I had to move is the one and only gay experience I've ever had happened in that time. And I won't go into any details on that. It was very brief, but I had to know for sure. I had to have it happen in the flesh to know for sure. And once it happened, you know, at that point, you probably, most people probably think, well, you should know then. You should tell people, tell someone, do something, get help. But I did the opposite. My egoic mind, which once again was my conscious mind, needed, needed to continue to pursue hockey and women for respect. The respect is all that mattered. And the only thing my egoic mind knew was respect through that. And being gay was the opposite of that. So I moved back to Utah. And this time was different than the first time. It wasn't the same adrenaline rush I got. You know, I, I got into a path where I was starting to pursue hockey in school, and things were going all right. I was working. But I began to alienate myself. And I alienated myself more and more and more. And it just it continued and continued and continued. And just got worse and worse and worse. Until right around, right around March. Because I was feeling good my second second go around in Utah. I was feeling all right for a while. But then March comes, right around March, April of this year. And I begin to get really depressed again. And it gets really bad. And I'm, I still have to work and pay bills. And I have to move out soon. And I'm still trying to do school. I'm still trying to play hockey. I've got the court stuff to do. I've got all this stuff going on. And it, it got so heavy towards the end. And eventually something happened to where very end of May I had I just had to come home and tell tell my parents and I've gotten to that this point now. But what the thing that the thing that got me to out myself that was that that's really the interesting um, kind of bizarre part of this story. So I had community service that I had to do for my DUI that I got. I got a driving with a measurable amount of substance back in October 2014. And I had a little bit of pot in my system. And I got pulled over and caught and they took blood and I got in trouble for that. I had fines to pay, community service to do, 48 hours, and drug evaluation. So the, the fines were paid pretty quickly. By August of 2015 they were paid. And all my shit, my community service, all that was due February 12th, 2016. So, months go by, and comes February, and I didn't have any of it done. Didn't have the community service, none of it done, didn't drug evaluation, nothing. So I thought they were going to come to my, or I thought, I thought they were going to send me a letter, and I was going to have to show up at court, and then they were going to give me what I was going to have to do from there on. But that's not what they did. They showed up to my door, and they arrested me. And... I remember sitting in the jail cell thinking, I'm going to be in here for a while. And I didn't I didn't know what I was going to do because I, I had a midterm the next day and I was going to screw up one of my classes. If I didn't get good enough grades, I wouldn't be able to play hockey next year. So I was really distraught at that time. But a miracle happened. My roommate got her sister to bail me out. And I got bailed out. I was able to get my final done, or my midterm. And everything ended up working out. Life kind of just went on from there. And then I went to court, I went to court two days after that, and they gave me an extension for all my stuff, my community service, all that. They said, you got three more months, get it done. I said, all right, it was such a great relief. But what happened was, I, at school, I had to get really good grades for school if I wanted to play hockey. I had to keep working, I had to find a new place to live. All this was happening at once. And I could not do community service. I got four hours done, and that's it. That's all I got done through about a, about over a little over a year of being able to do it, and I didn't do the drug evaluation. So I showed up to court on the day that it was all due, and I literally, this is my conscious thinking, I thought, okay, he's going to give me an extension, 
I'm going to continue to go to school, I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing, and then I'm going to find a new place to live, and I'm going to get it done after this, and I know I'll get it done after this. That's what I was thinking as I was walking to the court. Obviously, I got to the court, and he says, you're going to spend two, three weeks in jail at least. You know, we've given you enough chances. And when he said that, I freaked out, and before my, I, was, I actually was supposed to go up to the stand, I left and went home and told my parents I was gay, and now I'm here. So what happened, in case you didn't really follow, I didn't really specify it, but what was happening was I consciously wasn't able, I consciously was not able to out myself, to tell everyone who I was. So I had to subconsciously sabotage my egoic mind in order for these things to come to fruition. So how that happened was, how I would do it is I would set my alarms, and I would sort of set my schedule for the next day, and I would tell myself, I would say, I'm going to do community service at this time, I'm going to do it here, and I'm going to get this many hours done, and that's the way it's going to be. And I did this hundreds of times, and it, almost the exact same thing happened every time. I would wake up, I would immediately get bad feelings, knowing that I had to go, go to community service. I can't really specify the feelings, but I know they were just negative. I felt negative about it. And then almost immediately after, immediately after I would change my mind. My mind would just switch, and I would say, no, I'm not going to community service. And I would justify it to myself. I would say, I'm not going for these reasons. You know, whether it's I have school or I have, I'm trying to sleep, I want to sleep more so I can work out better later. There were so many justifications I made to myself. And then after that, I would say, okay, this is how I'm going to make up for it. I'm going to do more community service this day. And I did this repeatedly. I literally did this till the very last week in end of May. I literally told myself, it was the week, a week before all my stuff was due, I was, I was writing out how I was going to get all my community service done. And I was planning to do 48 hours in one week just can't believe I even thought that at the time. But what was happening, really, was before, like right as I had moved to Utah back in end of 2015, for the very first time I had thoughts about coming out. And I told myself that I have to. But consciously I thought, you know, first I'm going to gain respect. First I'm going to be do really good in school, I'm going to do really good in hockey, and then three or four years later, then I'll come out. That was what I thought. And I hadn't had even, I hadn't even thought about coming out at all up until that point. That was the first time. So just, and I didn't think about it much. Just passing thought every now and then. But it was in there. So what happened was, I knew I needed out, and the only way it was going to happen was if my egoic pursuits which were hockey and women specifically, needed to be completely sabotaged in order for me to to sort of wake up, I guess. And so in order to, for my subconscious true self, which was a complete slave, to come out. So since then, I've uh, been living at home, just trying to, I've been going to therapy, trying to get better trying to understand as much as I can and really I didn't really even get to this point what I'm telling you all now I didn't get this full picture up until a couple days ago it's taken me that long and essentially what I'm experiencing right now is it's post-traumatic stress disorder because I haven't I literally never thought about these things I mean I had but I had just touched the surface of these experiences and what they did to me and for the very first time in my life, I'm thinking about them. And it's everything. It's not just I'm thinking about one thing. I'm thinking about all these things that I had buried so much. So it's been a very difficult. But there's one other thing that makes it specifically difficult. And that's when it comes to brain development and specifically traumatic recovery, which is what I'm going through. The context and the environment is everything. So, when I grew up, I was taught to disrespect myself 
because being gay meant that no one would respect me. So the only way I was going to gain respect from the outside was by not respecting who I was and searching for it somewhere else. And that's, you know, that's what I, that's what I learned, that's how my brain developed. The problem is it developed in the very same environment, the very same context I'm living in right now. So, when you do something like that, it makes it very difficult to try and heal from these things when all you see around you is everything you saw your entire life through all these traumatic experiences. There's just, there's too many triggers around here. So I, I think it's good that I came home and I needed to come home part of the healing process. You know, I got family and friends here. So that, that it is important for me to be here for a little bit. But there's going to be a time in the very near future where I, I simply have to leave. I have to go out on my own, and I have to reinforce these parts of myself in order to gain respect for myself. And I can't find it in this context. You know, there's a lot of things I can do to help me in this same environment that I'm in. But it, I'll never get the full picture. I'll never reach my potential. I'll never grow like I want to unless I leave. Um, I, I really just hope this it, it, uh, this helps people understand a little bit better if you made it through the whole thing. Um, I'm still learning more about, about it myself, still trying to understand it better, but this is, I got to a point where I felt really comfortable that what I have, the insight I have gained from my therapy and everything, I find this to be very accurate to what happened. So I, I just hope, um, like I said, I, I just hope people gain a better understanding of what I'm going through. You know, why I post uh, very depressing statuses on Facebook. Um, really, the Facebook is it's because for a long time, it was the only way I was able to actually communicate my feelings to anybody was through Facebook. And I just sort of, I still have that problem because I still struggle still struggle talking to people. It's still very difficult, something I'm going to be dealing with for a long time. Um, but there it is. Uh, if you have any questions at all, you can message me. Anything you want to talk about or say. Um, I'm a normal person. I'm just going through some difficult times. But if you tuned in, thank you. I appreciate it.